welcome to MeasureCam. Yes, there's some awesome stuff on the board today. I'm really looking forward to it myself. And so I thought I would just uh, start the whole thing with a scatological theme today. This, this entire presentation is about shit, basically. But first, a little pop quiz question. Does anyone, can anyone in the audience tell me when this little fella was invented? Or where on what system he was invented? Sorry? Nope. Nope. Is it this mega bank from Apple? Nope. Was he invented in some kind of plumbing system? No. <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone tell me which country? Who said Japan? It's yours. Invented in 1999 and came into all our products via Gmail as an entry route. 2007 or 8, the poo icon appeared in Google products. There you go. It was all downhill from there, wasn't it? So, um, boring slide about me, blah, blah, blah. If it's not working on A-B testing or optimization, get in touch with me. So what is today about? Today is about 22 years of working on web stuff. And I think we've lost something in all that time. I think we've lost the human aspect of design. I would say that the kind of testing and research that I want to see happening is not happening still. It's really bad. And actually, these are all individuals. You know, they're not fucking users or visitors or cohorts. They're all people like you and me. We've got desires and fears and worries and barriers, right? And motivations, and they're all fucking different. They're not uniform users, you know, and you like to be treated like that, but we tend to treat people in groups like that really badly. And we're still doing it. We've lost our human side. So in this great rush to implement all these digital products, what happened to the wonderful service that I get in John Lewis? You know, the friendly smile, person answering my questions nicely and pleasantly, making me feel I'm having a good time with an interaction, unlike most web forms. So what have we replaced this with? With shit. That's what we've replaced it with. You know, and this is fucking <laughs> life for me in the digital world, right? It's just, you had one fucking job to do, and you fucked it up. So, have a look at this video. kind of seeing is, um, can I get back? No. Yeah, there we go. So this kind of stuff that I'm seeing is pretty common. <laughs> no, impromptu music aside. Um, 
This is what Pizza Hut's website looked like back in 1994, running SEO Unix. Amazing, remember that? Okay, and look, this is shitty form, right? A shitty form with a button. Lead gen, early lead gen, amazing, right? And so, you know, 22 years you'd expect awesome transformation. You know, 22 internet years is like 100 years of anything else, isn't it? So this is the pinnacle today, another shit form, with really shit copy and shit visual hierarchy. So this is the stuff that I get to work with these days. It really sucks, because it really hasn't improved. Yes, there's some good stuff around, but it, there's tons of shit like this. Just as a fundamental problem. These are all the things that I expected by now that aren't fucking here. Okay, anti-gravity, jetpacks. Okay, I can understand that, things like free energy. But why not artificial intelligent agents rather than lead gen forms? Why not instant, seamless online customer service? Not there yet. But the two that I'm most pissed off about Flying are learn. Sorry? Flying cars. Flying cars, yeah, yeah, I am pissed off about that one. Um, but these two, learning from stupid past design mistakes we've made, and basically getting more usable products out of it. We haven't iterated ourselves out of that problem. Why? Because we're fucking stupid, that's why. So let me give you a couple of examples of why this is. Millions of years of evolution, the pinnacle of product design encapsulated in the lonely single person microwave meal, right? And I get this Tesco Finest thing. So I'm having a Tesco Finest microwave meal experience. I go to the store, I buy it. I go back home and cry a bit because I'm on my own. And then I put it in the microwave and then when it's ready and I finish crying, I go back and I rip the lid. What happens? This shit, right? <laughs> there are about 22 ways that a microwave container can unsuccessfully rip where you get a little thin bit in the middle. My favourite is the square one, where it peels all the bit round the edge so that when you go back, you have nothing to get your fingers on, you know? So what do people do? They end up using a knife or picking pieces of fucking plastic out of their dinner for 10 minutes. This is what happens. This is terrible. So, a quick calculation. Four and a half billion sales of these premium products, three and a half pounds average price. Cost 90 seconds of wasted time charitably. That's 840,000 fucking days of people's lives in five countries in Europe wasted on friction with microwave meals because you can't be fucking arsed to do proper packaging. And it also causes injuries in elderly people because they get a sharp knife out, they stab it, and then they stab their fucking hands. I mean, this is not user experience. It's terrible and it's soluble because Tesco's, the same company, makes shit like this. It has a lid. You can take it off and put it back on and put it in the fridge. It's useful. So here's my manifesto on packaging. You should never require a knife to open it. It shouldn't require superhuman fucking strength, you know. I, I know a lot of people that can't open lots of things without their teeth or a knife or a pair of scissors. It's stupid. We can evolve past this. And you must be able to put this stuff away. If you can put a lid back on it, you can put it back and eat the stuff later. It's more sustainable way of having a microwave meal experience because you're wasting less as well. I mean, it's good for the fucking planet. There's the manifesto. Stop doing these stupid things. On Reddit, I love this. If it comes off in one, it's gonna be banging. If you're picking plastic out of your dinner for 10 minutes, it's probably gonna taste like shit. I agree because an experience is only as good as its shittiest part. Thank you, Tesco. Thank you. Anyway, amen. Fucking packaging, sort it out. Flies, when people look at flies, right? Let's talk about hygiene. Okay, you think flies, you know, normally people get a reaction like this, the typical micro gesture of disgust, okay? But is this, an evolutionary response, or were we taught it by our parents? Did it arrive in our DNA? Did we always fucking hate flies? Or were we taught this? But actually, in the early 1900s, British doctors figured out that a large driver of infant mortality, and if you ever know anyone who's had a child die very young, I mean, it's, it's incredibly tragic. So 
It was causing thousands of deaths every year. So they decided they needed to have a behavioural change, they needed to educate the public about flies. There were no refrigerators. So flies were landing on food and buzzing around and everyone was like, yeah, it's cool, lovely flies, you know. That all changed after they had this sort of advertising campaign that ran for years and posters like this. And the creation of disgust around flies, that reaction was a major achievement of the early 20th century. And the death rate from diarrhea and the infant mortality rate fell steadily from 1913 onwards. It's a fascinating story. But here's the fucking problem. Right, a hundred years later, in 2010, they swabbed people on the London Underground and nearly a third of them had faecal bacteria on their hands, like, and lots of it, right? Like, ew, not very nice at all. So why is that happening, right? Well, let's do a quick calculation on that. Yes, less than 20% of people in the world wash their hands, but that's mainly because they don't have soap and fucking running water. London's actually pretty good for those. So why aren't people washing their hands? Another thing, this is a large proportion of what people put down as food poisoning and then costs employers lots through sick days is actually to do with faecal bacteria, okay? So this part actually costs the economy somewhere between a billion and a billion and a half a year. Jesus Christ, it's almost enough to exit from Europe on that basis, isn't it? <laughs> oh shit, we've already done that. Um, but British travellers also get more ill on holiday more often than Americans, Australians, Europeans or anyone fucking else. No wonder they're not washing their fucking hands. So anyway, anyone, if you're meeting anyone from London today, it will be shaking hands like that, like a T-Rex. <laughs> the London handshake. But why is this? Because we are fucking stupid. Because we haven't learnt yet. You know, we've had a hundred years, right? Oh yeah, we sorted out that hygiene problem long ago. Yeah, feminism, uh, no need for any of that stuff anymore. It's largely sorted out. All this kind of bullshit, thinking that these problems have gone. They've not gone, they're very much alive. So, what can manufacturing and retail teach us? I kind of dipped into this. Why, how come these guys have had to survive in hyper-competitive markets? What have they had to do with their products to actually make them better, make them more efficient and productive? And if you look at the whole timeline of manufacturing, yes, there's a lot about automation. There's a lot about robots eventually coming. There's a lot about changes to the way the assembly lines are tooled. But actually, if you look at the whole story all the way to recent days, you can see that some people absolutely shafted other people. How? Because they were able to actually apply some methodologies that will allow them to beat other people in the market, even if they were bigger than them. And this is the rise of some of the Asian giants in car manufacturing. It's not down to robots, it's down to this shit, right? And this stuff is about the orchestration of people around assembly lines and products. And this stuff is there for a reason, right? So I use Kanban and Kaizen, continuous improvement, in my work now, right? And there's a good reason for it, because it's about people. So, you know, all this kind of transformation from a, a 1940s Finnish assembly line, which looks rather kind of uh, cruel, to modern day Finland, where there is this factory, it's completely automated. What kind of transformation have we seen like that in the digital space? Because I don't fucking see one. But the problem is, is that all, look at what all those methodologies were for. Get the quality up, get the defects and waste out, make all the employees more productive and waste less time. Agility, flexibility, rapid delivery, continuous and rapid change, market, demand, led planning, not having millions of cars made, but making them being led by the demand. All of these things had to be done because otherwise they'd be out of fucking business. You know, get it right or die. But retail can also teach us some stuff. They've got all these things an average department store has to get right. The toilets must work. You know, the lights must work. You know, you can't have chips on the floor, you know, or uh, it, even the air has to smell right. You know, imagine if it smelled of meat when you went into John Lewis. You know, it's, all of this stuff has to work perfectly. Otherwise, you get that thing of, your retail experience is only as good as the shittiest part. <coughs> and there are thousands of these little tiny and very important details that they have to get right. But what about us? 
we can't even get this fucking stuff right. We can't even make sure that it works on everybody's browsers. It doesn't work on Chrome. Fuck them, users. Mobile pay being paid, oh, no one fucking converts in mobile anyway. You know, the search is so bad, the performance sucks. You know, even something like, uh, when was the last time you changed your homepage, right? So imagine a retail store, oh, the window, we've had the same window for a year now. Do you like our window? It's getting a bit yellow, right? Oh, well, we might change it in summer. You'd be out of fucking business in retail. But I know tons of people for the same homepage for months and years. Idiots. But then there's an arrogance that some people have in our industry as well. And we need to beat this out of them. So a developer once said to me, he said, I was interviewing him on the phone, he said, people are fucking stupid if they use browsers like Internet Explorer. So I said, oh, I see you have two small children. I said, they're almost the same age. Do you have one of those double buggies where you take them out? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, so you go to town? I said, and does your wife take the children to town? Yeah. Uh, does she go shopping with the double buggy? Yeah. So when she gets to a store and she can't fit her fucking double buggy through the doorway, do you tell her she's fucking stupid for buying a double buggy? Or do you say it's the fault of the store for not having a wide enough door? And he said, that's a very good point. Have I got the job? No. <laughs> Fuck off. So this is the problem. All of these digital experiences are just littered with dog shit. But it's mainly invisible to us because in a lot of cases we don't measure it or care about it or try and get inside the customer's skin. But that's what it's like. I'm just stepping on this stuff all the time and it costs lots of money. And that's what it's like. The stuff that you're doing, the defects in your products are like having shit inside a retail store. It just doesn't go together. You have no idea how hard it is to find a picture with shit in a retail store <laughs> on Google. <laughs> Fucking hours of looking. That's what took the most time in this whole deck. Um, but how much do bugs cost? I use, I've got a tool called ProfitGrid.io and I've been using it to pull data on defective experiences in sites. And this is how much it's costing people. Two and a half million pounds a month. These guys, the bugs on their site were costing them almost three times their entire annual IT department budget, right? Because the amount they sell is massively more than their budget, but that also carries a risk that if they fuck it up, it could cost more than the entire IT department costs. So this is a lot of money. So when people say, oh, I have persuasion problems on my site, that'll give you a little lift if you fix those. If people say there are usability problems on my site, they'll give you a big lift, right? So, but what about bugs? Those will give you a massive lift if you fix those. No shit, Sherlock. So before you even do A-B tests or optimize, fix the bugs and the UX problems first because they're probably worth more money than all of the CRO and A-B testing put together. Seriously word. So those took less than five days of developer time to fix all of those. That's an ROI of 91,150%. I think that's pretty good. And that's all the shit you need to sort it out. All of those tools and a whole article that explains it. Now the bit you've been waiting for, we're all going to fucking die. So what is this? This is an amazing product. So cool. It's the world's first intelligent pet feeder links to your smartphone app, and you can schedule feeding times remotely. And give them an extra little food just to make you feel good when you're not at home. But oops, they had a server outage. Oh dear, what's gonna happen to little Fido? We are experiencing difficulties with one of our third party servers. You may experience a loss of scheduled feeds and failed remote feedings. No, my fucking dog will, right? <laughs> you know, it's not me that's gonna experience this. This is what's gonna fucking happen, right? You know, it's great. Uh, I've got this new diet thing. I go away on holiday and I switch off my email and when I come back, the fucking dog's thinner. It's great. It's really funny, but not when your dog dies, right? That's the problem. It's only just starting this shit. What about when everybody in China is making loads of Wi-Fi smart bulbs? Yeah, loads of cheap devices coming, some designed by idiots, most designed by idiots. Yeah, we've never built a digital product before. Oh, we've never designed one. Now we make one. What's wrong with that? This thing gives a fucking hole into your Wi-Fi network, right? So the more of these Wi-Fi enabled devices you put in your house that have security flaws in them, the worse it's gonna get. 
And it's not just going to become an inconvenience. Here's a hall of shame of all the devices that have been successfully hacked. Have a look and see if the shit that's in your house is on this list. But the massive problem with all this is they haven't looked at best practice security design, things like two-factor authentication. They haven't built an infrastructure to keep the Wi-Fi enabled light bulb updated with the right firmware, okay? So you get unfettered access to the Wi-Fi network and untrusted computers can connect to that light bulb and then use that to bridge onto your network. So these are the headlines that you will see in the next 10 years. Samsung toaster hack paralyzes Bay Area. Hungarian Mercedes hack shut down Uber in Budapest. Or a thermostat worm costs $4 billion. And this one, a search engine available for hacked baby monitors. Except this one is fucking true today. Okay, so this stuff is already happening. And there's a great article here called Internet of Things is a really stupid idea. People are going to die and there's fucking nothing we can do about it. It's great. But I think um, John Cleese kind of um, rather sums up this whole presentation for me. I think the problem with people like this is that they are so stupid that they have no idea how stupid they are. <laughs> <laughs> If you're very, very stupid, how can you possibly realize that you're very, very stupid? You'd have to be relatively intelligent to realize how stupid you are. There's a, a wonderful bit of research by a guy called David Dunning at Cornell, who's a friend of mine, I'm proud to say, who's pointed out that in order to know how good you are at something requires exactly the same skills as it does to be good at that thing in the first place, which means, and this is terribly funny, that if you're absolutely no good at something, at all, then you lack exactly the skills that you need to know that you're absolutely no good at it. And this explains not just Hollywood, but almost the entirety of Fox News. <laughs> I, think he summed, I think he summed it up pretty well. Um, but the whole, the whole point here is that we are largely ignorant. We need to be doing stuff to understand that we, we have all these areas outside our knowledge that we don't know. And the more you shine this light, the larger the circumference of stuff that you come into touch with. The more that you find out about what you don't know, the more you find out, out that you end up knowing that you don't know, okay? <laughs> I'll have to replay that one later. But basically, the more you explore this area, the better quality of ignorance you get. You actually know the purity and depth of your ignorance as opposed to being completely ignorant of that fact. Anyway, that's enough of that philosophical discussion. You need to get a better quality of ignorance. So here's my quick rehab plan for companies that are stuck in this. Firstly, what are the signs? If I hear any of this stuff, oh, we have analytics, but we just don't use it at all. Yeah, we, um, we have all these tools, but nothing happens. You know, we have customer insight, but oh, we don't fucking listen to them. Just don't do anything about it. It's really cool listening to it, but we don't do anything. So, some of the cures for these, burn down the silos. If you have this shit, enough project managers and business analysts to host your own IT conference at work. That's a good sign. No one team. If A-B testing is done this way, it's usually crippled. Endless meddling fuckwittery and sign-off, which is longer than any of the work itself. Any of these signs, you know, if the product is passed around, sort of like an unwanted crying baby at a party. That's a problem. So what are the models that other companies are using for this stuff? This is Uber and Facebook, who have these kind of independent teams around uh, with a, you know, a growth leader and then feature-driven sort of growth teams. And then you've got ones that are done by metrics. So you actually have someone in charge of growth, but then there are these metrics like retention, activation, acquisition, and so on. Very, very interesting. But actually, the one that works the best is this one, where it's not actually a separate fucking team. Yes, it's actually built into the product and the growth are an integrated team. And that's an important thing here. Look at the list of companies that are there. A lot of people are doing this very well. I'm not convinced the other models work very well. And this is what the FT has gone towards. We'll show that in a minute. But this diagram is my diagram that I put together, which is really my thinking of how you pull all this together. Design thinking to actually do the research and build of your product. 
then lean UX to actually sort of get something off the ground, agile to iterate within that, and then an optimization cycle that then takes your product onto new highs. So it allows you to build the right product at the right time, get it in, jockey it into place, and then optimize its conversion rate or other key metric from there. So this is really how I want everybody to build products. This is my ideal. It doesn't often work like that. But the Financial Times is a good example. They give small teams direct access to publish. So these guys can set, set up the analytics, they can change shit, they can publish to the website, they don't need to ask anyone. So they have tools, they have autonomy, and most importantly, they have lack of pesky meddling stakeholders. Uh, and there's no project managers or business analysts, this is all built into the team. The business defines an outcome. So if I'm in a team that wants a rise in corporate subscriptions, I say to that team, uh, I in marketing want a 15% rise in subscriptions in the next six months. But I don't tell them how to do it. I say, it's your job to deliver. If you're at Ferrari and you say, I'm the race director, I want one and a half seconds off our lap time, he doesn't tell you how to achieve that, he gives you the target and then you execute. And this is the important thing, that decoupling between people in marketing or other stakeholder teams defining the crappy features which you must execute to get the result they want is not the right way of doing it. And this MVP approach is in all their products, the, the, the alpha, beta, pilot, and then phased rollout, any large project infrastructures, and it really works. The way they said to me is it's like getting in a shower. You don't just turn the shower on in the hotel and leap into it and get roasted. You test it with your hand. Is it good? A little bit hot. Is it good? A little bit cold. Is it good? Just about right. Let's get it out now. And there's some really good stuff on their lab site if you're interested in what they're doing. But here's the increase. 50 to 70% of all the shit they built before was wasted or thrown away. Technical debt, it's worse than that. Would a car manufacturer survive in a competitive market with this kind of wastage going on? And basically, any time you asked, how long will that take? The answer was always at least 18 months. Oh, it'll be 18 months. Oh, that, oh, it's 24 months. So every project was late. Every project wasn't what the customer wanted and it didn't shift the metrics. But after they made these changes, every IT project was under time and under budget, and it was much more successful. And they jockeyed the products once they got them in. So this is the thing. These guys, you will not find the race director in there with his hands in the fucking engine, pissing these guys off as they're trying to uh, do something to the fuel injection system to get the one and a half seconds lowering in lap time that he wanted. No, he gives them the target and then he provides the infrastructure and support to allow them to do the fucking work, right? And that's the way we need to build products, you know, so wouldn't happen at Ferrari, shouldn't happen inside your company. And this is a quote from them. All this shit is just the same. Product changes and A-B tests are just the same thing. Where we're moving to is measuring and testing absolutely everything we do. So it tells us what works, what doesn't, what to keep, what to throw away and what we need to improve. It's just, it makes common sense. They're having a great time with this. So these are the five things that you kind of need to have in place to make this work. I call it the five-legged bar stool. The more legs you have, the more solid it is. So here's my kind of summary. Invest more in analytics, get rid of these defects. Reform your organization to solve these kind of problems because it's not gonna happen without you changing the fundamental way that people work together and build products. So don't just buy tools or do CRO, actually reform how you work internally. Stop reading best practice bullshit as well. Talk about your customers and find out what the fuck they want. Stop looking at other people's. Make sure you have both qualitative and quantitative inputs into any product build or test. Because, uh, you know, it gives you stronger um, sort of foundation for your bar still. But all of this is nothing without orchestration. Someone still needs to wave the white stick. And that's why the management methodology behind this stuff is so important. You can still have your ass handed to you by people without your budget technology or tools like these guys showed. And if your market's like this now and you're growing and it's easy, right, because there's all these extra customers you can acquire, well, what happens when it gets like that or like this? When your market matures and you're not ready and optimized, the other company who's in a hyper competitive situation with you will out acquire you, outgrow you, and out-compete uh, out you from a productivity point of view. 
So if you want to build transformational products, it gets to the same shit at the end once you get to the top of this diagram. And it doesn't matter whether you're doing UX testing, analytics, or project management, you get better outcomes the higher you go up here. And make sure that shit works on people's devices, because I don't care if it's really persuasive or you've got a cool brand, if it doesn't fucking work on my mobile device, that's a defect and it costs you money. So try and navigate your future with these tools and these methodologies. You, want, you don't want to go down these shit creeks. You want to run experiments and innovation that will show you how to get into these sunny uplands. And there's a final one I'll leave you with here. I'm not going to talk about this slide, but please read that article. This is McDonald's test store called The Corner. And all this McAfee stuff that you're seeing uh, is, um, is being tested right now in this store and then put into your McDonald's. It's actually an AB test store where they try stuff out. See your website as something like this that helps transform the rest of the business or your optimization work. Remember, it's really fucking difficult to solve a problem if you don't actually understand it. Thank you very much.